EPS Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Mark Blunden and this is The Leader. It's another strike day and more travel chaos, but thank goodness your railway services weren't hit by industrial action seven days ago as temperatures touched 40 degrees C. But once more there's commuter pain as mainline train services into and around London are crippled. It's the fourth day of nationwide rail strikes with just a fifth of the usual services expected to run, causing services to grind to a halt and freights being given priority over passengers. More than 40,000 RMT union members working for Network Rail and 14 of England's 15 rail companies walked out for 24 hours until midnight tonight. Here's RMT General Secretary Mick Lynch on the picket line at Euston. We've had a pay offer from Network Rail last week um, that is inadequate to suit the, uh, the needs of the dispute. Uh, it's, a, it's a pay off for over three years, which is nowhere near the rate of inflation. And the conditions that they wish to impose on that are not acceptable to our members. But on the train operating companies, we've had no offer on pay at all. Passengers were again urged not to travel on the vast majority of lines unless absolutely essential. Here's Mayor Sadiq Khan trying his best not to look back in anger and that failed no-strike pledge all those years ago. Uh, I'm really afraid the bad news is uh, because many of our services rely upon network rail lines, there will be uh, problems on the London Overground, there will be issues and potential delays on some of the Elizabeth line and some services will be disrupted. Joy, there's more to come on the railways on Saturday, while a tube strike is also planned for next month. Meanwhile, London has the highest proportion of travel complaints to the Ombudsman, so do rail strikes ever achieve their aim and at what cost to passengers? Today's row is over 8% pay rises, or the lack thereof, pensions and working conditions. But have these kinds of strikes ever achieved anything for their participants? Are they effective? To discuss, we're joined by one of Britain's leading transport experts, Tony Travers, who's a professor at the School of Public Policy at the London School of Economics and Political Science. So, Professor Travers, why do unions strike? They strike and have done so for a number of years because it's a way of putting pressure on their employers. In this case, train operating companies for the commuter rail and mainline rail companies transport for London, for London underground and the overground and so on. But they they strike or threaten strikes to keep pressure up on the management so that when negotiations are undertaken about pay and terms and conditions, um, the management knows there is the risk of uh, strike action and uh, disruption that that will cause to the public. Why is it always so hard to get both sides around the negotiating table? I think it's because... The unions for a long period now, and I don't think they would see this characterization as in as that unfair, keep, as I said, they, they keep the threat of strikes and the possibility of holding ballots on strikes ready and waiting as a almost a pre-negotiating strategy quite a lot of the time. And of course, this is publicly funded, uh, or at least it's a publicly subsidized pair of industries, the national rail and the London rail systems. And therefore, The unions know that negotiators are always keeping one eye looking backwards into Whitehall for what ministers want and train operating companies, for example, you know, have to consult the government over negotiations because in effect they're underwritten by the government. So this is a very political railway and it's rather different to, let us say, the negotiations between BA and its workforce or or Tesco's and its, just to take two examples at random. And are there examples of rail unions ever achieving their aims? Well, I think if you look at the terms and pay and conditions, particularly of drivers, but not only drivers, in the railway and indeed on the underground, they are very good by the standards of comparable workers. So there's no question that not only the earnings of, say, tube drivers, uh, but also national rail drivers, but their pay and their terms and conditions are very good. So the, the, the use of the muscle in this particular industry has over time worked. And what's interesting is that the coming of COVID and the decline of train ridership hasn't convinced the unions that this um, industry is any less able to fund them and give them the pay and conditions they want than it was before. 
Let's go to the ads. Please do stay there to hear more from Professor Travers on the economic impact of strikes on London's hard-pressed commuters and what the future holds. Why not hit rate and follow in the meantime? Welcome back. Professor Travers, what's the economic impact of these kinds of strikes on people's livelihoods? For many office workers, particularly after the pandemic, when they learned how relatively easy it was to work from home, the impact will be negligible. But the impact impact won't be negligible on people who make their money on an hour-by-hour basis or who run small businesses in town centres, central London, for whom any day of strikes or disruption, including snow or very hot weather, is bad for their business. So it doesn't affect everybody equally. And I think for people who can work from home, the impact is now negligible. Of course, in a, in a, in a different era, that might have been thought to be a problem for the unions who would fear that their capacity to hold the management, the management's feet to the fire would be reduced by that. But the truth is, so long as management knows the government will continue to underpin the railways and the tube, uh, the union can continue with their particular approach. What's your view on why Mayor Khan's no-strike dream back in 2016 didn't work? Labour politicians, be they Sadiq Khan or others, like to think that because they're Labour politicians, unions, including on this occasion rail unions, are sort of that they're closer to them or that the unions are going to be nicer to them. Well, the truth is they're not. The unions are looking after the interests of their members as they see it above all else. And, uh, you know, that means uh, Labour politicians get no special favours. And so attempts at no strike agreements have almost always fallen foul of the union's willingness to go on using the weapon and or threaten to use it. And of course, I heard earlier today, Peter Hendy, the former transport commissioner, now head of Network Rail, making the point that almost in, for the entirety of his period as commissioner in London, uh, transport commissioner, there were either strikes or strikes or threats of strikes. It's just like the weather. And on the other side of the political divide, there's been plenty of talk during the Conservative leadership contest about a strikes crackdown. What do you make of this idea? Well, there's no doubt that in the Conservative leadership race, the idea of strengthening the legislation that limits strikes has been discussed. So in particular, the idea of creating a higher threshold of the number of proportion of those who are members of the union and or who vote, who have to vote and then get a positive vote for a strike or a threatened strike, that you could increase those and also potentially increase the period between the vote taking place and when the strike occurred. Now, I mean, two things to say about that. One is the Conservative government has been promising them for some time, and here we are, only when the strikes kick off, does much happen or does more, it is it's suggested something will happen. Second, there is always a risk with this kind of uh, legislation that it further empowers the union, because if the government sets higher thresholds in terms of the proportion of those who must vote and so on, then if the union achieves those, and in some votes recently we've seen in some unions, pretty high percentages, then actually it gives the union leadership the power to say, well, look, we've got even more legitimate now than we were before. So the government has to be absolutely certain that if it goes for that route, it works in the terms that they are expecting. The other possibility is a minimum level of service, which would have to be maintained by law. Now, that might make things easier for commuters, but whether it would would fundamentally weaken the unions, I suspect not. And I think it it's sort of the discussion about all of this only during a strike, you know, tells us that the government itself only really bears down on these issues when they become news. And on fares, how are we looking for the next 12 to 24 months ahead? It seems rail tickets are even more exorbitant right now. Well, there's going to have to be a public debate about fares if we just get past the traditional January the 4th type shock horror fares are going up discussion. The truth is that for many years, railways, be they the National Railway or the Tube, in setting fares, were able to rely on the fact that large numbers of people had to travel in the morning and evening rush hours. And that gave them an enormous, solid, buoyant 
fair yield and Britain collected more from fairs relatively than other countries. And those days are gone. And against that backdrop, I mean, another way is going to have to be found to underpin the finance of the railways and the tube. And that is going to be by taxpayers paying more one way or the other, unless there are the kind of huge cuts, which I'm arguing are unlikely to happen. Therefore, you can see that the the mayor in London is looking at possibly having a much wider congestion charge yield uh, or system in order to raise more money nationally. The exchequer, whoever the uh, new, new prime minister and chancellor are, will have to find a way of underpinning the national rail system. So, you know, I think that the funding of the railways is going to tilt away from fair fair payers towards taxpayers for some years to come, unless there is to be a very radical reduction in the system, which, as I'm saying, I doubt there will be. And finally, thanks very much for your time. With an eye on the future, what's your current research focusing on and how long will it take to get London's transport back on an even keel post-COVID? I have a a watching brief rather than a a long-term research project, but a, a watching brief on the shifting sands. If you think about railways in London, they've gone through an extraordinary 20 plus years with radical improvements to the underground and to the commuter railways, the creation of the overground, the DLR, extensions as recently as the last couple of weeks to Barking Riverside of the overground, and most obviously Thameslink and more recently Crossrail. So massive investment in the system. And it would, by any standards, be a tragedy if after all of that modernization and investment, the system were not in the long term efficiently and effectively used. So I think politicians, both at city hall and national level, are going to have to think about effectively how they get the world back towards something closer to the world that existed in 2019 uh, than they've tried hitherto. They're going to have to try different fare structures for a while. You know, if everybody starts travelling in midweek, it doesn't make much sense, or middle of the day in midweek, doesn't make much sense having peak fares in the morning when nobody or everybody can choose not to travel. So they're going to have to think about fares, making working and traveling more attractive in order to build up the fair base once again. I think, you know, 10, 15 years out from now, probably most of the fair yield one way or another will have recovered, but uh, it won't recover unless there's a radical rethink of fair levels at different times of the day, who pays, and, you know, whether the taxpayer should contribute more in the long term. There's more on this story in the Evening Standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. We're back on Thursday at 4pm.